I'm Dr. Chris Burrett. Welcome to the ACOs, A Different Kind of Psychiatry Case Presentation Webinar. We're glad to have you. Today's presentation is entitled, Handling a Teenager's Rage in Therapy, presented by Dr. Jackie Bosworth. Dr. Bosworth is a child psychiatrist, an adult psychiatrist who practices in New York City, where she also sees families and children. She holds a position of senior medical director at a residential treatment facility in Westchester County for adolescents at risk. Welcome, Dr. Bosworth. Thank you, Dr. Burrett. So Dr. Bosworth, how did you decide to present this case today, this patient? Well, this child who's named Drew was a very um, violent and aggressive young woman and nobody was really able to help her um, in her past. And I think my training as a medical organist is what helped me not only to understand her, but to positively make an impact in her life. I see. So what did you know of Drew before she came to the facility where you're working? Um, she had just turned 18 uh, when she was admitted to our facility and she'd been in treatment uh, in residence since the age of 13. Wow. She'd been shuttled around from residence to residence because of her tendency towards violence and aggression. And, People and, couldn't handle her essentially. I see. And, and so what happened then when she came to your facility? What was that like? So we have several campuses and she was first on a sister campus, but she attacked somebody there and was transferred to our campus. Uh, and I see all new admissions for an evaluation. And then if they happen to be on medication, I see them monthly for medical um, management. I see. So what was your first evaluation with Drew like? What was it like to meet her? She was a very attractive young woman who spoke in a very matter of fact voice. Um, there was very little drama in what she was saying. It was, this is how it is. That's, that's the message you got from her. Um, and she was appropriate, answered all questions that I asked of her, but um, didn't show much emotion. What did that say to you? What did you, um, when you picked that up, what did that mean to you? It showed me that she was a determined young woman who um, had been through a lot and had been through this particular scenario before. Probably dozens of times, I'm sure, right? Exactly, yeah. Yeah, and so what happened next? How did things progress? Um, she told me about her anger, ultimately, at her father. She had been, um, her biological mother was drug addicted and she ended up in her father's care as, as an infant. Her father had since remarried and um, lived with his, his um, significant other and their daughter. And um, Drew didn't like her father because he forbade her from seeing her mother. Uh -huh her biological mother, who she said to me at this initial interview, I don't know what she was like, referring to her mother, when I was a baby, but she doesn't do drugs and she doesn't use alcohol now, and I have a good relationship with her. So this was very upsetting to her that her father wouldn't permit this. Mm. And she also seemed to be angry at being in the system, being shuttled around so much, being told what to do. She seemed to have a, a lot of anger, not just for her father, but for anybody who hampered her independence. I see. Hmm. And so um, how did things progress as she was treated in the facility? Well, Normally I would see her once a month, as I said, for, for medication or, or more if needed. 
but I barely saw her over the next few months, either because she had gone AWOL to visit her mother, um, had ended up in, in a hospital because she got caught on AWOL by police and then attacked the police, or just was angry and didn't feel like talking to anybody. So we had maybe two sessions before she then got uh, had an episode where she attacked one of the staff who happened to be pregnant. Oh, wow. And um, that woman got hospitalized as a result of the attack. So Drew was, again, shuttled to our sister facility where she remained in treatment for a short while, attacked somebody there, and then came back to us. What was the reaction of staff? to not only attacking staff, but a, a pregnant staff person. I mean, how did that woman react? How did the other staff react? I'm curious to hear. So, you know, I don't know that much about that aspect, uh, Dr. Burt, because um, what I read, you know, I read the incident reports. It wasn't, it was, happened in the cottage. It wasn't something that I was directly involved with. And, um, you know, I review the justice reports on it because that that woman took her to, to court as a result of the attack. Oh, wow. But that woman subsequently left and she was OK. I mean, there was um, no harm to the to the fetus um, and she had an, a normal childbirth. But again, Drew attacked somebody at this sister campus and ended up back with us again. So she was feared universally by a lot of staff that were working with her. Uh -huh. and, and so did that have an effect on how she was treated, how people looked at her, how people interacted with her? Absolutely. Um, I think most people, as I said, were fearful of her because they knew what violence she was capable of. Um, and she was a very determined young woman, as I said, who wasn't afraid to speak her mind. Um, but I think they also treated her with, you know, resentment and disdain and were constantly trying to assert their power over her, uh. which in my mind was the exact wrong thing to do with, with Drew. So what did you do? Well, over the next several months, we would have a lot of chance encounters, what I'd call chance encounters. She would be in places that she probably wasn't supposed to be. Um, she wasn't really attending school, but um, we have a a school on our campus and um, I would find her in front of the administration building or in front of the infirmary, various places that I would be going to. Um, and she'd just be there and I would try to connect with her. I would ask her how she was doing, if she needed something. Um, our administrative building is locked and I would ask her if she needed to get in. Uh, sometimes she'd be standing in the dead of winter without a coat. I'd ask her if she was cold, that kind of thing. I just tried to support her and to see her where she was, to see what she needed rather than tell her what to do. How did she react to that? I'm curious to hear. Um, she was friendly towards me and um, as I said, other people feared her and I, I didn't feel that way around her because- You weren't afraid of, of being injured or attacked? Not really. I mean, if I, I suppose if I had been in a closed environment and she was angry at me, I might've felt differently. But, you know, being outdoors or being in an open space um, and just seeing that this was somebody who was, very unhappy and had needs. Um, 
made me relate to that and not not so much to the potential for violence. I, I never felt threatened by her. I see. What's your sense of what she needed, of what she was looking for? Do you, do you have a sense when you were interacting just in these kind of chance encounters? I think she wanted something that had meaning for her. I think she couldn't relate to school. I think she couldn't relate to the rules that were imposed on her, the structure of the program she didn't respect. Um, and she was looking for some sort of connection, perhaps. Um, I think sometimes she was hanging out in, at, by the administrative building because she was waiting for her therapist to show up and she knew she could always talk to her. But then, you know, when she ran into me, sometimes there would be an exchange of a few words. I see. Do you have a sense of what the structure was like, whether she was with her mother or father or what her family environment looked like? Um, I found that out later. I found out when she was brought to me by her social worker one day to evaluate her for suicidality. I found out much more about what was had been going on. Um, oh at her father's house. Um, that day, it was just after Christmas break and um, she had gone home for Christmas and her social worker brought uh, her- Dr. Back. Bosworth, if I could just interrupt for a second. Sure. So just for the audience clarity, this residential treatment facility is different than a psychiatric hospital. It's longer term. Could you just describe it a little bit more for, for sure. people who are unfamiliar? Um, a residential treatment center is a non-lockdown facility. Um, the residents there attend school during the day throughout the year, summer as well. We happen to have the school on campus and they're permitted home visits on the weekends. Um, some of them rarely go home, but some of them go home frequently. Um, they get uh, medical care, 24 hour seven care there. Yes. And um, they get biweekly therapy with their social worker as well as various groups that they ad attend. Um, okay, like thank you. EBT training, that kind of thing. Okay, yeah, so, so let's hear about that incident when you- um... Sure. So, as I said, that was just after Christmas break um, and Drew was brought into my office by her social worker to evaluate her for suicidal behavior. Uh -huh. um, it turned out that she had brought with her um, a kind of eye makeup that had a sharpener in it and her social worker confiscated the sharpener because Drew was known to cut herself. Um, and, you know, you weren't permitted to have that as a weapon. And Drew, in fact, was expressing a desire to hurt herself and was angry at the social worker for not for taking away this, this sharpener. So when I saw her, um, She said to me, you know, Dr. Bosworth, won't you give me permission to have this sharpener? You know, it's something that I need to cope. And I asked her um, what she was feeling. I said that in my experience, a lot of people who cut themselves often are feeling so much anger that they can't bear it. And cutting themselves was their way of relieving that anger. And this seemed to resonate with her. Um, she started angrily talking about her father and how 
up until very recently, he had brutally beaten her when she didn't obey him uh, until she finally reported him to the authorities. And that was the time that he then forbade her from seeing her mother. Uh. And she, her mother probably had something to do with whatever was, was going on that prompted her to have the strength to report him to the authorities. And so I think um, as a result of that encounter, he, like I said, forbade her from seeing the mother and Drew was furious at him. I see. Uh, so she vented anger for a long time in my office at that point. Um, and I gave her permission to do that. I said to her, you're safe here. You can scream and yell as loud as you want. You can always come to my office to scream and yell if that's something you need to do. Um, and that probably is what, you know, prompted her to respect me on some level and to connect with me. Um, <laughs> After I said to her, no, I'm not going to allow you to have the cutter, you know, I, I can't do that. Um, but I can let you get, get some freedom from these emotions. She started to cry. She burst into tears. And for the rest of that session, she basically sat there crying until the emotions finally drained. and. Um, what, what's your sense of what happened there? I think she probably realized that she was disrespecting herself by cutting herself and and maybe on in some way connected with the fact that her anger really didn't have a place to go normally. Hmm. Um, and I think she felt relief at that point. Yeah. Dr. Bosworth, it stands out that what you said, what you said, Drew said, which was that I need this to cut myself. Um, there was truth to that, you know, because before you had that interaction with her, it sounds like she didn't know what else to do, but she needed relief. Right. Um, People that are impulsive, like Drew was, tend to have so much anger that they can't tolerate the feeling. And it breaks through in impulsive ways. One of them is by attacking other people, and another is by attacking oneself, namely cutting. Mm -hmm. It sounded like you stopped the impulsive behavior and so her then her feeling she was able to connect with her feeling. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I, I guess retrospectively, that is kind of what happened in that session. I mean, at least for that session, she was able to let go of the desire to hurt herself. And mm -hmm. in the end of that session, we talked about respecting yourself and how important that was. Yeah. Then no. after that, I, I saw her frequently, you know, um, monthly or, or more. And she would even seek me out on occasion when she just wanted to talk to somebody. Uh huh. And what's your sense of, so she was working with you and her therapist and um, her therapist was there when you had this interaction with her. Was she able to learn from that to see your perspective uh, with Drew? Yeah, I mean, um, the fact that Drew was relieved and let go of the suicidal thoughts that she had been voicing and the desire to hurt herself was an obvious teaching point, you know, for anybody that witnessed it. Yeah, yeah. 
I have somewhat of a supervisory role over the social workers. So, you know, I think there was some discussion afterwards um, privately with the social worker about what had happened to, you know, make, make sure that she understood. But nobody had ever told Drew before that it was okay for her to yell and scream. Mm. Um, nobody encouraged it. it. It strikes me because what you're speaking to is um, knowing which impulses to encourage and um, back, you know, with a patient and which ones to discourage or, or stop, whether you're a parent, whether you're a therapist, you know, if there's all these impulses coming out, which ones are the healthy impulses, which ones are what we call neurotic impulses. And you were clear with, with Drew, which was which and, and what to encourage and, and which to let go. Is that, is that how you see it? Well, kind of, I mean, we can't equate an emotion with an impulse. So um, the impulse is really to act a certain way. Uh -huh. And that's based on the emotion behind it. So if a person's feeling angry, they can express that anger in the moment, which is healthy. If they, you know, don't harm anybody, they just make their point known. That's how we defend ourselves and define ourselves in life. That's how we protect ourselves. Right. But when the anger builds up to a point because it's been, you've been told, don't express it. You're not allowed to show anger, you know, use your coping mechanisms or um, write in your journal, you know, do things that don't allow the emotion to come out. It builds up to such a, a pitch that it comes out impulsively. I see. What do you see as the role for you know, what we call coping skills these days, journaling or doing various mechanisms. Um, how do you see the, the role of, that they play? Um, it's kind of hard to answer because there are certainly situations in which it would be much better to write in your journal or to, um, go for a run or use a punching bag yeah but there's no real replacement for the physical expression of emotion and in my mind a real coping mechanism is screaming into your pillow or punching your bed doing something that gets that anger out and we're, we're talking specifically about anger now uh -huh. um, or, or if it's sadness, you know, going somewhere where you can cry. That's how you deal with emotions. Um, it doesn't mean that, you know, there aren't times when writing in a journal or something else doesn't help. It's just there's no substitute for allowing your feelings to be known. Yeah, yeah. And, and so then how did things progress with Drew? So after that episode, um, as I said, we had a lot more interaction and um, ultimately she finished her schooling and uh, wound up going to live with um, a half sister of hers. Um, I, she even tried a walling and and uh, staying with her mother for a while, and that didn't work out. Um, which was a very positive thing in a way because she was able to appreciate the fact that the image that she had portrayed of her mother was inaccurate and, and to accept the reality of that and, and make an alternative plan. Oh, wow, yeah, yeah. Were there other um, 
cousins, uncles, aunts, uh, extended family involved in her life? Just the half siblings that she knew, some of who were, were equally disturbed. Um, but this particular sister lived in New Jersey and had a stable job and um, they had a positive relationship. So that's kind of the last that I heard of her, but it, she was able to get through the program without further incidents. Oh, wonderful. Uh, you know, it, it, it begs the question, was she violent or did she attack peers or just staff? Yeah. No, everybody. Anybody. Everybody. Yeah. Anyone who got in her way that prevented her from doing or saying what she wanted? Yes, absolutely. Police, anybody. She wasn't afraid of anybody. Wow. Wow. Is there anything else about her story you'd like to say before we go to the questions from the audience and, and just describe and discuss some of these points you brought up in a little bit more detail? Um, I just want to emphasize the importance of meeting a person where they are. You know, other people had made demands on Drew all the time, kept, you know, I never once said to her, what are you doing here? Or why aren't you in class? Um, I just tried to connect with the person in front of me. And as a medical ergonomist, that's critical for successful <laughs> treatment of a patient. Yeah, you literally met her where she was. It wasn't always in your office. Right. Yeah. No, it, it's, a, it's a wonderful um, view of you just looking at the big picture and not getting lost in specific symptoms and what she said that one time and, and um, just seeing, who, seeing her for who she is and where she was at any moment that you interacted with her. And I think also, at least with somebody who's prone to impulsive behavior, being a, a consistent figure who's there for her is, is critical. Um, you know, a lot of teenagers have impulsive behavior and, um, Having somebody who's there for them is all the time, you know, whenever they need them is pivotal in, in changing that dynamic, improving that dynamic. Yeah. You know, to do that, though, I think you have to be aware of your own feelings that get brought up in working with someone who's impulsive, whether that means a, a child, a, a pa adult patient. Um, you know, whether you're a family member or a professional. So I had the sense that you were aware that she could be provocative, she could um, provoke a reaction, you know, a, a harsh reaction from people. Did she ever provoke that kind of reaction from you that you had to keep in check or did that naturally work out easier for, for your relationship with her? She never did, um, you know, I'd hear these stories about things that she had done and it certainly registered with me, but um, again, my interaction with her was very respectful and she basically treated me with respect. You know, after refusing to talk to me initially, um, she came around. Yeah. But I can understand how, you know, impulsivity and with a family member is, it's a very different kettle of fish, so to speak. Um, you know, you're not their therapist and um, it's a much trickier situation to deal with. Yeah. Dr. Bosworth, I can't help but think about a patient I work with. So some of my work is in my private practice and, and another part is in corrections. If you could believe it in the corrections environment, there's a lot of impulsive patients. 
Yeah. And the first time I met this young man, I never met him before. I just said, hello, my name is Dr. Burrett. And he basically said something like, uh, nice to meet you, Dr. Burrett. You look like a metrosexual idiot. Are you a metrosexual idiot? <laughs> and, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> um, so in some ways, it sounds like you may have gotten lucky because I, I, I had to, whoa, like, you know, who are you? Like, you to speak to me. I, I just, I'm a nice guy. I just said hello. And that's how you treat me. So I felt that myself. Um, so that's Did why I was say curious. that to him? Did you say but, I'm a nice guy? Why would you talk to me like that? No, this is what I'm thinking, right? Yeah. But, you know, maybe that's the way to deal with it. Yeah. You know, um, maybe establishing boundaries from the start in a person who attacks you that way is, is what, what needs to happen, but, you know, in a respectful way, not in a way that yeah. attacks them. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I'm also thinking about, you know, I work earlier, I worked in um, children's hospital, children's psychiatric hospitals, and, and, you know, I've only been practicing for about 10 years, but I've heard that it's been become more difficult and children's lives have become more difficult. They're more likely to need hospitalization. They're more likely to need residential treatment. Do you have a perspective on that of just what children are going through now? Um, it's funny because I've started writing an article about that, um, <laughs> kind of. I, um, I have some thoughts, you know, I think definitely COVID has negatively impacted people's ability to relate to one another as human beings um, because of the mandatory isolation, et cetera, and the remote learning. And, you know, even the fact that people haven't fully returned to work and children haven't fully returned to the classroom. Um, there's an aspect of computerization and being on a screen all the time, rather than being able to touch someone and feel their presence in a very direct way that I think has had an extreme negative impact on children growing yeah. up. Yeah. The thing I would add is that the observation is that impulsiveness generally has become more common in children, I, th I think in adults too. And um, that highlights the point of dealing with um, unsatisfied impulses and repressed impulses, you know, that the change in our culture of, of generally being a repressed people versus being unsatisfied people. Um, what stands out is how difficult, again, it reminds me of my corrections work and also I think the difficult children that may come to a facility like where you work. Um, she had some relief by her attacking staff or people that did give her some relief and that makes it difficult to help her with that because um, in, in some ways you're trying to redirect and, and give her a rational way to, to direct, um, express herself emotionally, but, but that's in some ways taking away the other things that she's doing, which can be very challenging as compared to someone who's so repressed, they just need encouragement and to take the, some of those blocks away so they can express themselves. How do you see it? Well, I think what you're saying is absolutely true. What, in one way I was lucky because the person that she was trying to hurt when we had that very meaningful encounter was herself. Yeah. And so um, just getting the ability to sort of turn that around to help her to say, you need to respect yourself, you know, made a huge difference. It, it, she then was able to get the emotion out and um, it was a win-win situation for her at that point. You know, she just 
had this enormous relief and screamed and cried for a, a long, long time. Um, and because afterwards she was able to make better contact with herself, she did start to respect herself and did at the same time have relief. You know, Dr. Bosworth, I just got chills thinking about what you set up and maybe didn't even realize. You were respecting her through these chance encounters. You know, she wasn't respecting herself. Other people weren't respecting her. And you just had these chance encounters just respecting who she was. And, you know, I almost wonder if this encounter with, with the cutting came up, like the first time you met her, I wonder if it would have had the same impact because you've been laying the groundwork for, I respect you. Why aren't you respecting yourself? Yeah, I, I think, you know, if that had happened early on in our relationship, it might not have had the impact it did. Yeah. Which I think also underscores the importance of uh, a therapeutic relationship that takes time to build trust and you can't just force it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And your situation in a corrections facility <laughs> is, uh, you know, extreme, uh, obviously, and mm. much more difficult. Yeah. Plus, but in some ways similar that neither of them necessarily want the treatment or to be there, you know? Right. Yeah. So um, you mentioned it, but the, just I want to clarify, just in case there's anything we're missing, an audience member asked, you know, how old is Drew now? And do you know how she's doing? I wish I did. Um, we don't really get much feedback unless somebody happens to know of something. Um, it's been a, about three years now, so I honestly don't have any further information on her. Yeah, we can hope, hope she's doing well, you know. There's a, a question from the audience. If a five-year-old rages when he or she doesn't get their way, will they outgrow this behavior, like throwing a tantrum? Hmm. Um, will they outgrow it? They might outgrow that specific means of tantruming, but if the underlying need isn't understood or met, they may continue tantruming in other ways. So I'm not sure that outgrow is, is the right word for it. It, it may change, but there's, they're asking for something by tantruming, something's wrong. Yeah, I, you know, I think that's a great response and it's hard to answer a general question like that because each child is an individual and has individual needs and especially in their relationship with the parent or caregiver. Um, so so I, I agree with you, which is that that anger and that frustration is there's a frustrated impulse that, you know, are they reaching out for love and, and somebody's busy or, or is it something else, you know? Um, so the, the details matter, I think, for individual children. Yeah. There's a question about the, the facility and, and how you work with the patient. Did all the patients have a therapist and a social worker at the facility? Or is it a combined function? How does that work in a residential facility? Um, all of the residents have a social worker who meets with them therapeutically a couple times a week and, and sees there's various groups that they attend and run as well. Um, I have, like I said, some supervisory role over the therapists in terms of how they deal with their patients. Um, and not all children or adolescents are seen by me after the initial session if they aren't on medication and and never and nobody feels that they need to be medicated. I see. Going back to Drew, 
did you have a sense of how she spent her time when she wasn't in school and her free time? Uh, what did she go off to do? Um, I know she liked music. Um, on the other campus, they, there's um, a whole animal, there's farm animals and dogs and things. And I know that she was involved with that there. Um, but I don't know. Oh, and I think she liked hairstyling as well. And uh -huh. that was something that she did do with peers and even with some of the adults on campus. I see. You know, I was just thinking how lively she sounds. You know, she is very intense. And I think it's often that that happens with someone with such a high charge, you know, such an intense life to them, um, especially in a difficult circumstance with her family, it becomes that much more explosive. Is that how you see it? Yeah, I, I think she um, was extremely high energy. And that was one of the things I'm, I most respected about her. You know, she was somebody who was going to fight for her life. Yeah. And um, that helps. Yeah, yeah. So there is a question from the audience about cutting. Now, Drew, you saw her cutting. You saw the function of her cutting. Is that how it is for other patients? Is it different? How do you see it? Um. Some people are remarkably non-talkative about the reasons for their cutting. So it's hard to make a complete generalization about it. But with the ones who are able to express some insight into the reasons that they cut, it has to do universally with repressed emotion, you know, we're told in our society to be quiet, not to get excited, not to get angry, um, to do things to avoid our intense feeling. And when we have particularly intense feelings that are being repressed over and over again, they don't go away, they don't disappear. Sometimes, and, and this has been my experience with people who are cutters, they get numb from the intensity. And so most cutters will tell you they feel nothing and that's infuriating to them, intellectually infuriating, but emotionally as well on some level. And so they feel that cutting is going to give them intense pain and relieve the underlying suffering, which they no longer have good contact with. Yeah. Yeah, that's similar to the patients I've worked with and how I see it. Um, there's usually a lot of intensity there. And often I've, I've heard the feeling nothing, you know, it's intolerable to feel nothing. Yeah. Um, but often there's there's a lot of feeling, and it does seem to go with with people who, um, you know, sometimes I don't know if it's that they're not talking about it, but there that there's no there's not always words for it that the sensation the feelings that are there, um, and that does seem to come up often that I've noticed too. Yeah, you know we can't always get angry at the people who are making us angry. And um, you can't tell that, off your boss, you mean? <laughs> precisely, you know. Uh -huh. um, so there's a lot of times where anger tends to build up inside of us. And um, in a child who's impulsive and a child who's had a horrible upbringing um, and been brutalized, you know, you, you have to expect that there's 
not going to, there's going to be very unhealthy ways that they have of dealing with their emotions. Yeah. There's a question from the audience about, um, is it ever good to tell a kid to just go in the room and hit a pillow or scream into a pillow? Or is that just the purview of a therapist? You know, could, could a parent do that? Could another person do that? Is that just a therapist's role? Yeah, no, I um, tell parents all the time to encourage their children to get their anger out um, in healthy ways like that. You know, hitting hitting a, a bed or screaming into a pillow or or going for a vigorous run with them or, you know, something to physically get the emotion out so that it doesn't sit with them and, and harm them. Yeah. The one thing I would add is that, yeah, I, I don't think that has to be just the therapist saying that I think a parent can certainly do that and, and often should. Um, but it, it can't be used in a mechanical way of, oh, go hit the pillow again, because you have to be clear on, on what the function of what's happening with the child and, and what they need at any one moment. And parents have to learn to accept their child's anger at them. That's, you know, part of our, our role as parents and educators with our children. Um, we all make mistakes and, you know, rightly or wrongly, people are gonna be angry. <laughs> um, tolerating your child's anger is a healthy thing to do in general. Yes, and I, I think that also underscores um, part of the wonderful aspects of training in medical orgone therapy is that having our own therapy to be able to tolerate um, other, you know, other people, but specifically our patients' strong feelings, including those feelings toward us so that we don't you know, act out neurotically when they need to express those feelings toward us. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And in some ways, you know, I even said this, being a parent is, is you know, like um, being an involuntary therapy. You have to face that with your children, these strong feelings that they have toward you. And, and that's just what you have to do, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's not like, you know, they're going to continue being angry at you forever. If you allow that feeling to come through, you can often get to what's underneath it and, and affect some change, you know. Yeah. Here's a question. Is it okay to put a child in their room until they calm down and hold the door closed so that they have to stay in to kind of contain them? Personally, I'd say no. Um, I, it depends, you know, if a, if a child has gotten to that point where they, they need to be locked in a room, something's very wrong. Um, with a young child, there's an element of fear that you're inducing in them by locking them in in the room alone. And um, that's a very unhealthy thing to do when somebody's screaming at you out of some sort of need. Um, so no, I mean, the short answer to that is I, I don't, the only time I could think where that might be appropriate is if you adopted a child who had a long history and and you were fearful and this was the only way to contain them. But, you know, that that's an entirely different scenario and not, I don't think that's the question being asked. Yeah, that, that, that's my impression too, is, is that um, generally, if there's some kind of emergency situation where there's serious harm being done to someone and, and you're doing that temporarily to get to the next step of what you're gonna do to intervene, then that may be rational. I never wanna say, never to something, but, but generally, yeah, it, it suggests there's something more going on that needs to be addressed before you get to that point. Um, but again, I think individual circumstances, individual children and families, those details matter. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, someone asked about the point of view of patients who cut themselves who report feeling not feeling pain at all while cutting. H have you come up to that? Yeah, I mean, if they're if they're really numb to their feeling, there's almost um, a physiological numbness that goes along with it. And so there have been people that have said it doesn't hurt. Um, I think it hurts afterwards, you know, they tend to get infected and, and um, not heal properly. And, and it's not that the person can't feel pain, it's that they can't feel it in that moment. I see. I, I haven't had that particular um, situation, but you know, if, if someone can be emotionally or physically contracted, you know, away from the surface, then they could be dead into emotion. They could be dead into sensation, and it, you know, it makes sense. Is being afraid to get attached to anyone in life something to worry about? Uh, will it result in having to repress emotions since one since one doesn't want to invest emotionally to anybody? Um, in a word, yes. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, if you are afraid, we all need people, we all need relationships, you know. The basis of, of what Wilhelm Reich wrote about as the father of medical ergonomy of, of ergonomy was love, work, and knowledge are the wellsprings of life. Um, being afraid of your emotions and not being able to connect with people is, is, is a pathology. Yeah. And I would add that, you know, different people are different in terms of how many people they connect with or how broadly they connect with society. You know, there are introverted people and extroverted people. And so if we're talking about anybody, that's a sign that something is amiss. But if we're talking about a small, you know, some people have small groups of close friends, some people are just out and about with everybody. So I guess it depends what's really being asked, but, but having no connections with anybody suggests something is underlying, yeah. Is there, is there any other um, ideas or comments you'd like to make to the audience before we stop? I think I just want to emphasize that, you know, anger is not bad. Um, it's not something to be avoided or coped with. It's, it's, it's a protective, normal, healthy emotion as long as it's comes out appropriately in the moment doesn't harm you know other people or yourself and for me that that's what stood out in this this case um, with Drew. Thank you Dr. Bosworth it was a wonderful presentation and discussion. Thank you Dr. Burrett. And thank you to the audience for joining us today and a special thank you to the donors of the ACO who make our work possible. I hope you'll join us for our next webinar that will be presented by Dr. Edward Chaska on Saturday, June 11th at 4 p.m. His presentation, presentation is entitled, The Road Back from a Life Stunted by Marijuana. In the meantime, I hope you listen to our podcast, the Different Kind of Psychiatry podcast, where you can hear the audio recordings of these webinars, as well as original content. We hope to see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.